welcome to the session everyone today um, firstly i would like to thank the institution of structural engineers for uh, organizing this event and giving us an opportunity to present about one of the um, the newest topic in the post installed river uh, design methodology um, so we will be talking about the current design method um, and its limitations and how the new design methodology which has come recently uh, you know uh, as per the code is solving those limitations and uh, giving us uh, the benefits for us engineers so today um, as declan mentioned earlier i have my colleague uh, visam kuri who is the engineering manager uh, here in hilti emirates um, myself working as national specification engineer and uh, together as a engineering team uh, here we are uh, supporting the structural engineers community and uh, architects and consultants as a whole uh, in the uae so without further ado let's get started on the presentation um so uh, just to give you uh, the agenda for today's session is uh, firstly for the benefit of everyone here i would like to talk about uh, the basics of post installed rebar uh, we will just understand the definition and uh, also understand the types of uh, applications that you might uh, you know uh, occur on the job site um and then we will understand the current design methodology which is based on tr023 and ead33087 i will let you know what these terminologies are later in the session um then we will also talk about what are the limitations that we are facing with the current design methodology and uh, then we will talk about the new design methodology which is called as tr069 as per euro code 2 then the benefits of it and finally we will have a question and answer session at the end of the session um so during the presentation if you have any questions please drop them on the chat box and uh, we will uh, you know get to them when we are done with the session so let's get started um what is the definition of post installed rebar so post installed rebar is uh, when we have a requirement of connecting an existing concrete to a new concrete so that is uh, you know the post installed rebar concept here on the left hand side of the picture here you see old concrete and this is the new concrete we are connecting these two concrete uh, elements using a rebar where we are using a chemical as a bonding agent uh, which is connecting the rebar to the you know rebar with the old and new concrete with the bonding principle here now on the contradictory on the other side you see uh, there is a steel plate we are connecting to the concrete so Co connecting any steel members to the concrete is comes under anchor technology connecting concrete to concrete is rebar technology now as you can see here this particular anchor technology what you seeing here is a chemical anchoring theory so you are using a chemical here as well you are using a chemical on the post installed rebar application as well so the chemical is same as you can see here on both the applications the chemical is same uh, but the design principles that are for rebar the design principles that are for anchor is different also the modes of failures differ from uh, you know with each methodology as well so although we are using the same chemical we will be we have two different third party certificates which are known as etas european technical assessments two different um, etas one with the rebar design principles one with the anchor design principles so the coefficients that are considered for anchor is different the influencing factors or coefficients that are considered for rebarring technology is going to be different yeah so i hope the definition is clear now now moving on let us understand uh, what kind of applications to be typically see on the job sites so as you can see here it could be a simple example could be a slab to slab extension which is a balcony uh, slab extension um, some of the application will include slab to wall uh, wall to wall connection and even bridge extension as well so these are most typical uh, applications that you will be seeing on the job sites in addition to that whenever you have uh, i mean let's just imagine you have a construction uh, we ha you have a existing building already and you would like to extend the building by another floor you have a you know five story building or something you want to extend the building then comes the requirement of adding a new column or new beams right so when we have to add a new column again post installed rebar application is required beam to beam extension corbel construction sometimes uh, closing the openings in walls and slabs 
Uh, a typical slab opening closure would include uh, in high rise buildings, you typically have uh, you, you would have left an opening for uh, raise, you know, erupting the tower cranes uh, for the construction uh, benefit, right? So these openings should be closed once the construction is ending. So there as well, we use the post installed rebar um, application. Adding on to these applications, one of the another segment of application that we can see is the strengthening applications on the existing buildings. Um, this usually comes under retrofitting and renovation jobs. So these applications include the uh, wall strengthening, column jacketing, beam jacketing, and even slab enhancement or the floor enhancement as well. So these are typical applications that you will see on the job sites. Moving on, uh, let us also understand from the workflow perspective, um, these post-installed rebar applications can be grouped into two groups. One is a planned application, another one is an unplanned application. Now, when I say planned, uh, the planned application is um, when you have an application of a post-installed rebar technology uh, as part of your detailed design already. Like the client is already going for a renovation of a building, then we for sure know that these columns needs to be uh, e extended. There has to be new columns added to the old columns. So this is a planned application. Here we know already that this renovation is going to happen. An unplanned application is something where, um, you know, you have a um, the concrete pouring job is happening, the reinforcement might get displaced, um, you might have misalignment of the rebars. So these kind of job site mistakes will call for an unforeseen um, you know, situation, which will be grouped under unplanned application. Now, this is from the workflow perspective. Although we, we have grouped it in this way, uh, nowadays, the post-installed rebar uh, application uh, can also be looked at as an alternative way of construction. Um, for example, uh, these days contractors do believe that when they are constructing the staircases, for example, uh, instead of bending the bars, uh, they would prefer inserting a new rebar. So this way, uh, in addition to these grouped uh, applications, we can also look at it as an alternative uh, way of construction as well. So um, when I talk about post-installed rebar applications, um, I did mention to you about a chemical product or the you know mortar that is being used to bond the rebar to the existing concrete, right? So this product has to be qualified under a European regulatory framework. Now, this framework is having three main pillars, as you can see here. The first one is the product qualification. Here, um, a third party will assess the product and they will test the product and give up qualification of the product. The result of this qualification is used to come up with a technical data. And this technical data will have uh, the product characteristics and also the product performance characteristics. You know, in a real time application, what is the performance characteristics of this product being used in an application? And then this uh, result will be used um, in, the, in the design method based on Eurocode 2. Right. So this is the three main pillars of the European regulatory framework. Now, we did understand from the workflow perspective how we are uh, differentiating the uh, post-installed rebar application. Now, let us understand from the design perspective. All these post-installed rebar applications can be clustered into three groups. One is the splice connection. The second one is structural joints. And the third one is concrete overlay. So when I say splices, it's nothing but your lapping or the lap splice configuration. Here you have a new rebar adjacent to the existing rebar itself. Um, and the new rebar is uh, you know, using the chemical and the concrete. We are transferring the tensile forces to the existing uh, rebar here. The second one is a structural joint. Sometimes you might have uh, overlapping here and sometimes you do not. So these come under structural joints. Uh, the third one is concrete overlay. This is the, I mean, the, the overlay application in itself is a vast subject. So today we are not focusing on this subject. Today we are mainly focusing on splices and structural joint configurations um, because our design methodologies that I'm going to discuss also will be focused on these two. Now, until now, how are we going to, I mean, how, are, how have we been designing uh, the post-installed rebar applications is um, the provisions in Eurocode 2 uh, based on technical report 023 and EAD 33087, these were the um, design assessments that were used in uh, Eurocode 2. And uh, these rebar, uh, you know, these documents or the, these, these, these design methodologies 
can were only giving us uh, methods where we were executing the post install connection as straight rebar because obviously when you look at uh, inserting a rebar once uh, in, into the old concrete or the hardened concrete there is no possibility to have a bent rebar as such so as you can see here this is the splice configuration and even when we had a moment uh, it was a requirement to have a splice configuration here but in most of the job sites today when we uh, you know the kind of applications that we get obviously we will not have an overlapping of uh, existing rebar so then that is where the limitation is coming from uh, even when we had a moment it was required as per the code it was required to uh, design the connections as splice configuration now with this existing design methodology uh, so far, we were able to cover um, the applications uh, which are, uh, you know, an overlap joint, uh, rebar connections of slabs and beams, for example, slab to slab extension or beam to beam extension, um, or it could be an overlap joint at a footing uh, where we are uh, adding a new column or a wall. Uh, again, here a splice configuration is required. Or when we have simply supported connections, uh, for example, end anchoring to the slabs or beams. So, and also structural elements which are primarily uh, stressed in compression. So typically like, you know, when what is missing is uh, this application where a structural component is being subjected to moment. So uh, in the current design methodology uh, based on EC2, this particular uh, application or the structural element which is subjected to moment is not covered. But typically 30 to 40% of the job site application for post-installed rebar would be uh, structural connections where bending moment is acting. Now, it is not that until now we have not come across these kind of situations. Definitely uh, there were these uh, you know, uh, connections being designed, but we did not have a design methodology which was accepted by the code. That was the main uh, limitation. Now, uh, let us understand, since we are talking about the current design methodology, let us understand how we are des designing these uh, lap splices and anchorages of structural uh, joints. Um, so the EC2 provisions provides uh, the design specifics for splices and in case of structural joints, we could only design them considering as uh, simply supported members or with the splice configuration like I explained before, uh, like where we had overlapping bars. And hence the design formula for, based on EC2 for both splices as well as structural joints are almost the same. So let's look at the design formula that we had for uh, calculating the design embedment depth. It is the product of several fact influencing factors with the uh, you know, required embedment depth. So now how do we calculate this required embedment depth is um, the diameter divided by four, then which is multiplied by the design stress applied divided by the bond strength. So this is the formula for calculating the uh, required embedment depth. Then you multiply that with several coefficients um, these coefficients are also part of your uh, ETA or the third party uh, certificate that we get based on the European regulatory framework. Now, just to give you a, a you know, detail about these coefficients. So alpha one is a coefficient for uh, considering the form of the rebar. Uh, usually for post installed, it is going to be a straight rebar. So it is definitely going to be one. And for alpha two, it is the factor of uh, concrete cover and also the spacing with, ne with the next rebar, adjacent rebar. Um, then alpha three is the concrete confinement, I mean, the confinement reinforcement coefficient or the influence of the uh, confinement uh, reinforcement. Alpha five is for the effect of pressure uh, transverse to the plane of splitting. And alpha six is nothing but percentage of lapped bars relative to the total cross sectional area of the concrete. So these influencing factors will be multiplied with this formula in order to get the design anchorage length. Now, earlier, as I mentioned, when we had a moment resisting connection, um, I did mention that based on the current provisions, we had to design them either as a spliced connection or um, you know, we had to resort to an engineering judgment. Now, in, with this limitation, in order to, in the traditional uh, way of doing it, uh, how do we solve this uh, problem is you have a concrete member, you need to uh, design a moment resisting or a rigid, uh, rigid connection. So the only way was to break open the concrete, expose the existing reinforcement and then weld the uh, new rebar and then go on with the new construction by pouring the concrete. But look at this uh, entire process. It is, a, I mean, it is a time taking process 
plus it is also cost um, intensive um so hence there is a requirement and this limitation of not having a code uh, you know codal code compliant method for rigid connections or moment resistant connections this was a gap that we were facing this gives a way for a new milestone which is tr069 with the inclusion of tr069 uh, with ec2 uh, we are able to cover the moment resisting connections now until as recently as 2019 we were still using the old methodology but now with tr069 coming in 2019 and 20 um, we have a design method for anchorages uh, post install rebar with improved bond splitting behavior when we compare it with the previous design method but one mandatory requirement for to be qualifying to uh, you know use tr069 is having the chemicals or the products that is used in uh, post installed rebar application must be assessed using this ead with this ead assessment and with the tr069 design methodology we can now cover this application which was a gap in the previous design methodology yeah so to get a bit still more you know better clarity about uh, what i said in the earlier slide TR069 is a combination of uh, norms and guidelines of your reinforced concrete construction code which is EC2 um with combining that with anchor uh, theory which is eurocode 2 part 4 so let us understand uh, the design principles like we also understood the design principles what was considered earlier in uh, you know uh, as per the eurocode 2 provisions now with the TR069 inclusion let us understand the design principles so the new tr069 as i said combines the reinforced concrete design principles uh, eurocode 2 with anchor to concrete uh, anchoring to concrete principles eurocode 2 part 4 uh, here the individual failure modes of the system connections uh, of the rebar uh, you know steel yielding or concrete cone resistance and bond bond splitting resistance these three are the main design resistance that are being considered as you see um bond splitting resistance and concrete breakout resistance is mainly from the anchor theory that we are bringing in here and uh, also uh, the design or uh, i mean the design approach in using tr069 is based on the establishment of a hierarchy of strength between these three resistances what i mean by this is the minimum of these three resistances is going to be decisive factor for uh, based on tr069 so just to give you a little bit of more information on these design resistances um, let us look into each one of them individually so the design resistance to yielding is nothing but uh, the steel strength factor and can be obtained from the following equation what you see here uh, it is mainly the function of the cross section of the steel and the steel strength itself and uh, gamma ms is nothing but the partial safety factor for steel failure if you see this formula this is the same as we see in eurocode 2 as well uh, this is the same for reinforced uh, as in the cast in rebar whatever the steel strength yield formula is there this is the same formula what we are using here in post installed rebar as well because end of the day we do want the post installed rebar to behave just like the cast in rebar that's the whole principle moving on to the next uh, design resistance that i spoke about is concrete cone breakout resistance um this is the major differentiating factor compared to the previous uh, you know theory as i said uh, we are combining this tr069 uh, with the reinforced concrete theorem uh, and the anchor theory this formula what you see here is from the anchor theory so because in the anchor theory we consider the concrete breakout but in rebar theory earlier we were not considering the concrete cone uh, breakout um also uh, here the formula given is a, is the same as anchor theory as i explained but all these factors what i am showing here we will not get into detail of this but these are these factors you can get it from the eta or the third party certificate what i talked about um typically i mean just to give you a hint this is the factor of uh, the edge distance and the concrete cover the influencing factor due to um, the cracked concrete whether the concrete is cracked concrete or uncracked concrete and also eccentricity of the rebar as well whether it is too close to the edge or is it too uh, you know far away from the edge so these are the factors uh, you know that are that are given by this psi letter here and uh, moving on the design bond splitting resistance again one of the factor that we have we have we have considered in anchor theory is being part of tr069 because it is a combination of two theorems 
Now, if the load on the tension bars is applied eccentrically, or the values of uh, the concrete cover, minimum and maximum concrete cover, are different for each tension rebar, the resistance of uh, the concrete, uh, the bond splitting resistance, shall be calculated for each rebar. And how do we calculate this? Is we are bringing in a formula for tau RKSB, which is which will give us the individual rebar uh, bond splitting behavior, and then this is multiplied by the embedment depth. Uh, multiplied by the diameter of the rebar and then pi. So it is a long formula. We will not get into each of these factors here, but all these factors, again, you can get it from the relevant ETA of the chemical. Um, again, it's a factor of diameter, the concrete cover, the concrete cube strength itself, and uh, or again, the concrete being cracked or uncracked. So these, form, these uh, coefficients or the influencing factors, like I said, you can obtain it from the relevant ETAs, ETA documents. Now, considering these uh, design resistances, and like I said, the minimum of these design resistance uh, will give us the decisive, will become the decisive factor for calculating the design resistance for a rebar. Now, with this design principles and inclusion of anchor theory along with the uh, rebar theory, what we are going to achieve is that we are going to add more application. The range of applications um, is going to be added to the existing applications. What I mean by this is so far with Eurocode 2, we are able to design a slab to slab or slab to wall application, beam to wall application, beam to column application. But with the inclusion of TR069, which is again based on EC2 as well, we have, uh, I mean, now we can design column to foundation wall to foundation, slab to wall, beam to wall, beam to column, when there is a moment uh, acting on these structural elements also. So simply that we have now a solution for moment resistant or rigid connections uh, based on TR069. Again, uh, just to highlight that chemicals that are being used in these kind of applications when you have moment resistant connections shall be qualified based on this EAD. Now, I did talk about the bond split uh, behavior. Now, this is another advantage of uh, TR069, is that we get to utilize a higher bond strength of the chemical here. So in this graph here, on the y-axis, you see the bond strength of the chemical. On the x-axis, you see the concrete cover itself. So the further away you move uh, in the concrete, that means as the concrete cover increases, you should be able to achieve, you should be able to utilize better bond strength of the uh, chemical. Now, with the EC2 provisions, um, the code was actually limiting the um, bond strength to as equal to the concrete bond strength itself. And hence, we were not able to utilize the complete or the uh, full capacity of the chemical itself. But with the inclusion of TR069, like you can see here, the red line is starting further away from the EC2 line here. That means we already have a chemical which is starting with the higher performance. And then because we are, we are uh, utilizing the uh, concrete cone strength to the maximum uh, cap capacity, the further we go into the concrete, we are able to utilize the better bond strength of the chemical. That means importance is also given to the uh, concrete, uh, the chemical bond strength. Which is, I mean, uh, the benefit of this is uh, actually you're optimizing the design uh, anchorage depth compared to the previous uh, provisions. Now, ju just to depict that in a, a pictorial represent representation here, uh, when you put these, uh, you know, any for any certain uh, geometry for a new concrete member to be added to an old concrete with the moment, uh, you know, acting on top of it. Um, with the earlier codal provisions, like you can see here, the embedment depth is 315 mm. Inclusion of TR069 as a design methodology, we are able to reduce the you know embedment depth, and this is mainly because of the bond split behavior advantage, and also like the um, because we are including the anchor theory as well, we are able to utilize uh, those design resistances as well. Now, um, you all are aware about uh, you know profits. Uh, you know, softwares that we uh, provide to our engineers to design any applications that come comes across. So, for even for profi rebar applications, we have Profis Rebar software, which is now available with TR069 inclusion. So, it is now uh, possible to design your uh, connections on the software. Um, I will not be getting into the details of the software today, but if you want to know more about the software or if you have any applications that needs to be designed, we are here to support. So, you can get in touch with us. 
Finally, to summarize, uh, let us look at the key advantages of uh, TR069. So for me, the main, uh, the three main advantages um, I look at it as the compliance, um, optimization, and productivity. What I mean by compliance is uh, a code compliant design is now avail available for moment resistant or rigid connections in post installed rebar applications range. And uh, I mean, when, when we talk about optimization, it is nothing but we are significantly able to uh, reduce the uh, you know, embedment depth. That is an optimization. And also, we are increasing the application range in the post installed rebar connections. So, this is another advantage. Um, plus flexibility during planning and detailing uh, moment resistant reinforced connections because now it is also available on Profis Rebar software. So designers are now able to utilize this software and uh, be more productive on having these designs covered. Uh, also, if you look at the bond slip behavior, the graph that I explained, um, as we have covered tested and you know tested for different concrete covers. This is helping in uh, reducing the embedment depth. Like earlier, we used to have longer embedment depths. Now we can reduce it. Um, also, if you uh, like, I discussed about the safety factors that are adopted in TR069 is the same as in uh, EC2, uh, that is Eurocode 2, uh, and which is for steel yielding, and EC24, which is for concrete cone uh, breakout and bond splitting failure modes, which ensures a high level compatibility. Uh, of the design output in accordance with uh, DR069 based on Eurocode provisions. So all in all, we have a code compliant design methodology and uh, we have now optimized embedment depth and productivity is increased both on site as well as on from the design perspective. So this is the summary of uh, having TR069 based on EC2. Now, before I move on to the question and answer session, I would like to just emphasize on one point that uh, the resistance on the re reliability of any post installed rebar application depends on the installation quality or the application itself, because there is a bonding chemical bonding that needs to be achieved right so any uh, post installed rebar to perform as per the design application or the installation is the key An uncleaned or improperly cleaned hole can result. Um, in in a, in the reduction of the load bearing capacity of up to 60%. So if you do not have the hole cleaned properly, that can uh, you know have an effect on reducing the load bearing capacity. So in order to achieve uh, the full bond strength, a uh, clean and dust free hole is very important. And so Hilti came up with a methodology called as safe set, which eliminates um, the human error completely. So I just want to play that video, take a look at the video, and then we will get into the question and answer session. Hilti has made one giant leap forward in the way adhesive anchoring is done, introducing the HIT HY200 system. Inadequately cleaning holes during installation can reduce the performance of conventional chemical anchor systems significantly. Hilti's safe set technology eliminates this factor almost entirely. In both cracked and uncracked concrete and with anchor rods or post installed rebar, holes that clean themselves, Hilti's revolutionary TECD and TEYD hollow drill bits combined with HIT HY200 and VC2040 vacuum make subsequent hole cleaning completely unnecessary. Dust is removed as you drill, providing for faster drilling and a virtually dustless working environment. No cleaning required? The new HIT Z-Rod eliminates the need for hole cleaning altogether. Its unique shape works as a torque control bonded anchor in hammer drilled holes. Drill the hole, inject the epoxy, install the anchor, and move on. The Hilti HIT HY200 system with safe set technology provides outstanding load values, equaling anchors set using traditional installation methods and is up to 60 percent faster to install. Less steps, less time, less room for error. Leave those traditional anchoring methods in the dust. Hilti HIT HY200 system. A small step for contractors, a giant leap forward for your next job. Hilti, outperform, outlast. So that was the video. I hope the message is uh, quite clear. Now, let's move on to the question and answer session. Let's 
things. All right, very good. Uh, first of all, thank you, Vijayashri, for the wonderful presentation. I think it was extremely informative and very well presented. I appreciate it. All right, so we have a couple of questions. The first question from uh, Mr. Muhammad Yasser. He was asking whether this um, uh, new standard or new design standard can be applied also to pile foundations, okay, especially when the piles are in tension. And the answer here is yes, you can use it. And now, uh, basically, out of our experience, we used to do a lot of designs when, for example, the rebars in the top of the pile were shifted along one side of the pile during the pouring of the concrete because of the pressure, of course, applied while pouring. And we were using this to repair the starter bars by doing a post installed connection. And usually, because due to the high loads, the high embedment depth was required. Now with TR069, we have the advantage, as Vijaya clearly mentioned, we have the advantage to fully utilize the chemical bond strength of the chemical anchor that we are using, which, by the way, the bond strength actually exceeds the uh, bond, bond strength of the concrete itself. So we are able to also enjoy less embedment depths. Okay. Uh, one more question is from Mr. Ahmed Karim. Does the software work with different codes like ACI 318? So there are different softwares that um, also from Hilti's side, we have also a different software that um, uh, complies to ACI 318. However, the most commonly used uh, code standard in the UAE is the Eurocode 2, okay? And now the TR069. The reason is it's it's more advanced and you are able to um, do an assessment that is more relative to post-installed connections that is also relevant to um, uh, the EATs as Vijaya has explained earlier. However, in ACI 318, as long as you are able to verify that the bond strength of uh, or the chemical anchor that is used behaves exactly like cast in, then you can apply uh, the exact same uh, design principles for uh, cast in bars as well. So the Eurocode is more advanced. Uh, the Eurocode is more heavily used here in this uh, area, but still, if the design is required on ACI, we also have different softwares that can calculate for it. Um, I think we also, there's a question from Mr. Ahmed Dweider. How does the cone failure in TR069 relate to more traditional methods given in SCI guidance and similar? I'm not really sure if you can uh, elaborate a little bit more about the SCI guidance. Maybe until um, uh, the elaboration comes in, but I just want to uh, explain. So as Vijaya has ex explained, in uh, the ETAG Annex C, which later on was superseded by the Eurocode 2 Part 4 as a design standard for post-installed anchors, which is connecting a steel uh, member to the concrete, which is basically any base plate that you see in the job site. So one of the failure modes that you design for, uh, for the resistance is the design resistance for concrete cone failure. So the concrete cone failure has been part of the design as per the anchor theory, the theory or the Eurocode 2 part 4. And since splicing is not available uh, in some cases for the post-installed rebarring, then we are not able to transfer the loads from the new rebar or from the new concrete through the rebar to the existing rebars. Then we have to um, transfer these loads into the existing concrete itself. And as you know, the load is transferred to the, to the concrete in the shape of a cone, hence the name concrete cone failure. And uh, when you design for the, uh, in TR069, you design for the concrete cone failure, you make sure that the um, load transferred into the concrete in the shape of the cone doesn't actually exceed the strength of the concrete and breakage doesn't happen. I hope I answered your question. Please uh, send a follow up after if, uh, if, if it's not clear. Uh, Mr. Ahmed Karim, do you recommend any site test to confirm the design by TR like pullout tests? So this is a very, very good question. And this is one of the most, uh, let's say, um, misunderstood uh, uh, concept here in the UAE and other in other uh, regions as well. So the only way, the only way to confirm a design 
is by making sure that the design software and the design calculation has been done as per the site conditions, okay, with a chemical that is third party tested. The only way to confirm that a application of a post-installed rebar is safe is only when you have used it through a, a design software, okay, and the design software will tell you what chemical must be used, what is the size of the rebar, and what is the embedment, okay? All of this would ensure that you have a safe application. Now, pull-out test is needed only in two cases. Case number one, when you want to verify the application, you want to verify that uh, the application of, um, uh, you know, the chemical has been filled uh, properly, the hole has been cleaned. This is why the pull-out test is done. Now, another reason why, why you would want to do a pull-out test in general, not specifically for post-installed rebar, is to do an assessment of the um, uh, assessment of the strength of the anchor with or the chemical or the rebar relative to an unknown concrete. So, if I have a concrete that I don't know what is the strength of, so I need to install an anchor or a rebar in this concrete, and I want to assess what is the uh, design resistance or uh, the design strength of my application then I do a specific assessment pull-out test. It's called a uh, pull-out test for assessment. Uh, then we have a question, steel base plate connections for steel columns. The traditional method gives an equivalent area of shear failure. Uh, I think this is the um, uh, elaboration from Mr. Ahmed. Steel base plate connection for steel columns. The traditional method gives an equivalent area for shear force failure of the cone surface area. Okay, so um, uh, here again, we are speaking a little bit more about uh, the anchor theory. So in the anchor theory, just like how we design for the steel, uh, design is, uh, that is how we design um, uh, for the steel, uh, steel failure, whether breakage or bending, we design for the concrete cone breakout, we design for the edge breakout and so on. We also have the failure modes um, uh, for the shear cases. So here, I think what you are referring to mainly is the anchor theory and the design standard that falls for the anchor theory is the Eurocode 2 part 4. Okay, and in the Eurocode 2 part 4, you are absolutely right. Even in the shear, um, uh, even in shear loads, we also design for the failure, for the edge distance failure, the concrete pry out, which is similar to the concrete cone, but in shear, it does not come in the shape of a cone, it pries out from the uh, yeah. back edge. Okay. And as I, as I have just mentioned, this is part of the Eurocode 2 part 4, but in the rebar theory, as Vijaya has mentioned, because we don't have splicing, we need to check for the concrete cone breakout in the application of post-installed rebar. And that's why we took, or the code has taken the concrete cone breakout design resistance and applied it within the post-installed rebar as a check. Does the extra strength we achieve in the new method mean that with the chemical, the bond strength exceeds the concrete rebar bond strength. Uh, yes, this is absolutely the correct statement. So before with the Eurocode 2, with the, um, uh, the chemical bond strength for every uh, chemical anchor in the world for all the suppliers had a, um, let's say, uh, a limit. It, it had a limitation. It was, um, uh, it was, the maximum was constant for everybody, regardless of the chemical you use. But what does this mean? This meant that in many cases, when you are trying to design for post-installed rebar, the embedment depth that was required, in many cases exceeded the concrete thickness that is available. So basically, what does that mean? That means that if the post-installed rebar, the embedment depth required is higher than what is available in the job site, then you need to break the concrete, uh, do the rebarring again and make sure that the starter bars are there. And this is, of course, not feasible, time consuming, costs a lot of money, and in many cases, very hard to apply. So now with the TR069, we are able to utilize the maximum bond strength of the chemical, which means that we will be able to also reduce the embedment depth in many design cases. Of course, when we are far away from the edge of the concrete. What was the maximum span of new cantilever slab added successfully to the existing concrete structure from the previous from previous your experience? I will come back to it. So 
Um, if you are referring to the width of the new slab of the cantilever, I'm not sure if you are referring to the uh, to width or the maximum extension cantilever, like uh, in length uh, perspective. So this this would be very dependent on many factors. So I will not be able to give you a straight away answer right now because every case would be different in terms of the ge geometry of the existing concrete. What is the existing rebar inside it? What is the chemical, uh, sorry, what is the concrete strength of that specific concrete? And then relative to the, if I understand what your question is correctly, like uh, the length of the cantilever, it will depend on the load and whether the existing concrete available that I would like to put my post-installed rebars in, whether it will be sufficient or not. So I highly urge you, if you have a case like that, please get in touch with uh, your Hilti uh, representative, and we will take all of these design inputs, which are the uh, concrete geometry, the loads applied, the existing reinforcement inside the concrete, and then we will design it for you. Um, question I missed for Mr. Sajid Anthony. What is the current bond strength of the material that helped in complying with TR069? A specific value um, is only available on ETA. Okay, so all the values of all the different chemicals, you will find it on the ETA. Here it is important to note that there, as Vijaya has mentioned, there's an ETA that confer, conforms or that is represented for the rebar theory or the uh, TR069. And then you have ETAs that are conforming to the anchor theory as per the Euro Code 2 part 4. So the values of this bond strength might be different. Okay, so this is something that you always have to keep into consideration. But the only reason why this bond strength is helping us with TR069 is because the limitation as per the Euro code 2 has been uh, removed. So different chemicals after that, of course, it would depend on the chemical, but it is not limited by the Euro code 2 anymore. So it's open as long as you are far away from the edge of the concrete. And this is all is part of the design. I think I think I have answered all the questions, if I'm not mistaken. If anybody else has any other questions, please go ahead. We'd be more than happy to answer. Okay, another question in the chat box. How is the influence of existing reinforcement? Uh, considered? Would it increase based on amount of reinforcement? Existing reinforcement considered, would it increase based on amount of reinforcement? Uh, so basically, the existing reinforcement and the existing concrete, this is something that is out of the control of anybody. So basically, if I have a, a, a an existing slab and I would like to do an extension of the slab, as I have mentioned earlier, when we design, we take the geometry of the existing slab, we input what is the existing reinforcement, the size of the rebar, the spacing of the rebar, what is the concrete cover, and so on. And then for the design of the new slab or the slab that I'm trying to extend, I'm trying to design the post-installed rebar, the embedment depth of the post-installed rebar, so this load transfer can happen. Now, in some cases, you might see that the loads applied on the post-installed rebar are very high that the existing reinforcement will not be able to, um, uh, uh, it will not be able to accommodate. In this scenario, you will have clearly a report that would say that this application is not safe and it's not possible as per the existing code. So in that uh, specific um, uh, scenario, you would need to be looking at a different, um, uh, a different solution, like for example, maybe trying to add some extra support somewhere or maybe thickening of the existing uh, slab itself for you to be able to accommodate for the new structure and the loads acting upon it. Okay. Um, I think that's, uh, that's all the questions we have at the moment. Uh, Anybody else has any other questions? Sorry, my, I just noticed that my speakers were on, on mute. So if somebody said something, maybe I have missed it. 
I think uh, I think it's okay. Um, I think that's all the questions we have at the at the moment. So um, yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Vijaya and Wissan for a very very interesting uh, presentation. Um, and just to just to confirm uh, if any of the engineers have got uh, uh, design or design checks they they want, they can just um, contact um, Hilti Direct uh, for assistance. Is that correct? That's correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, good. And your software is uh, available to download also? Yes, the software is available to download. It's free of charge, of course. And uh, if anybody is interested, please get in touch. Our contact details are on the screen. I would be happy to also uh, train and assist you on how to use the software as well. Okay, that's great. That's great. Um, okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, what we'll do now 